Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Be seated. God made everything and it was good. Our fellowship with Him was very good. But our rebellion shattered every relationship. Our sin brought the curse of death. We can see that things are not the way they are supposed to be. Our world is broken. We long for our redemption. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into our world. He lived and died and rose again before returning to his Father's right hand. Soon, Jesus will return. And every eye will see him, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb slain for sinners who overcame, and he will make all things new. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word. Let's go to Revelation. This morning we'll be in Revelation chapter 10. If you do not have a Bible, then they are in the chairs around you, and that is our gift to you. If you do not have one, we want everyone to have a copy of God's Word. You will need it today as we open our Bibles. In our last study together, uh, before Irfan was with us last week, we looked at the six trumpets that unfolded over the two chapters, Revelation 8 and 9. It was a difficult, it was a heavy sermon to preach. Some of you are in careers, or maybe you have retired from a career where you were a person that had to bring difficult messages to people at times. And you know how hard that is to do, but it has to be delivered. The phone call has to be made. A family's waiting in a room, and you are the one to go in and share the news with them. How we share the news is of utmost importance. The judgment that we see unfolding here will intensify. Admittedly, it's overwhelming. It's hard for me, it's hard for us to get our minds wrapped around all that is coming. We can't even begin to conceive of all the sin, of all the hearts and lives of humanity that has lived for all time, and God bears that. And the sins of all who would believe was placed on the shoulders of Christ as he went to the cross, suspended between a righteous and holy God in heaven and sinful man on earth. The cry has gone out, how long, O Lord? Since Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, How long? How long will we be separated? Gives birth to Cain, gives birth to Abel, and then Abel is murdered by Cain in the first family. How long do we have to put up with this, Lord? How long, how long, how long? It's been the cry down through the ages, one of the longest lasting questions there is. Job asked this. He was suffering greatly, and his friends were of not much help to him. Job 12, verse 8, he says, The tents of robbers are at peace, and those who provide, uh, provoke God are secure. I'm confused about this, Lord. They bring their God in their hand. They're serving idols, Lord, and you're letting them 
get by and I love you, Job would say. I don't have any sin hidden and I'm in the dumps here. Job 21, verse 7, why? Okay, the Lord is not afraid of our questions why. The question is where do you go with the questions that you have? Go to the Lord. Job says, why do the wicked live? Reach old age and grow mighty in power. Their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and no rod of God is upon them. Do you hear what he's saying? Come on, Lord. Why? The psalmist, Psalm 10, verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of troubles? Where are you, Lord? Why? When I returned from traveling, I brought the message that we worked on throughout the week of the conference on Bible exposition, Psalm 73, verse 16. Here's where everything changed for the psalmist. If you will remember that message, that in verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. I have no idea what kind of week that you have had this week. All that would have kept you from gathering to worship this morning, and yet you chose to gather with the people of God and say, I need the word of God, to wash over my heart. Maybe your emotions are all out of control. Maybe uh, there's all, (laughs) maybe you've turned the news off this week. You know, it's just, you don't know what to do with all that you're experiencing, but you knew one thing. I have got to be with the people of God. And Satan will do everything he possibly can to keep you from this place, to be under the word, because we're sanctified by the word of God. It's his truth. So loved ones, we long for God to step into this mess. We long for him to make all things new, to make all things right. The scriptures promise that this day is coming. And so the people of God, we wait with great anticipation. We know this day is coming. Habakkuk 2 and verse 14, it says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas as the cover of the sea. We know this is coming. The earth will be filled. We know this, but we don't see this right now. We don't see this in Gaza. We don't see this in Israel. We don't see this in Ukraine. We don't see this in Russia. We don't see this in DC. We don't see this at Columbia University. We don't see this at UCLA. We don't see it with people chanting terrorism on our own shores. We are saying, how long, how long? But then we have to look at the person in the mirror. How long was the Lord patient with you? with the terrorist against him that I see in the mirror when I brush my teeth. Committing treason against the Most High God. I want to be king. I am the chief idol maker until he saved my soul and changed me and adopted me, gave me a new name, gave me a new family, gave me new life that is never ending. Have you experienced this life? Because this is going to temper us. This changes us. Again, the graphic will come on the screen just to try to help us understand why we're entering into this second interlude. All right, so in this section we've been studying, we see the seven seals. All right, the first six seals, then there was interlude number one. And we went through that and we looked at that. And then the seventh seal. And in the seventh seal, uh, this will move quickly on the screen. In the seventh seal comes the six trumpets. And we looked at those in those chapters. We're still waiting on that seventh trumpet. And here we are where the X is. We're in the second interlude. We're in interlude number two, and this is another pause before the great bold judgments come, and they will come, and God's wrath against sin, against all evil, all iniquity, everything that was due when Christ was suspended on the cross, and he could have, should have, would rightfully have crushed all of humanity for what we did to the living creator, son of God, and instead, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, and he died in our place so that we could be forgiven, but he will make all things right, and he will make all things new. So here we are in this second interlude. This interlude number two will go from uh, chapter 10 on into 11 and verse 14. It's the longest of the interludes. It's another calm before the storm of those coming bowls, the bowl judgments. 
It gives an opportunity for John and for his readers, those early churches, for us to just pause, to just take a time out. You see coaches say, hold on, time out, time out. I need to talk to the team. They're not doing what we practiced. Get over here, sit down, get some water, let's talk again. Game's on the line. Hang on a second. That's what we have here. That we can, and this, this phrase keeps coming back up in the propositions, how do we take this to heart? That we as the people of God, if we take this message deeply to our hearts, it's going to change our lives. Our application, how does this apply? Which again, I will say it, and I'm going to keep repeating it. We're not studying Revelation to simply have more intellectual information to argue with people. That will not help anyone. It's important to understand what you believe. It's important to understand why you believe it. But we're not here to argue and just debate. We're here to learn what is God saying in this text? What does, it, what does it mean? And how do I apply it to my life? And then how does that apply to my loved ones? The people that bear my own name, my family, how does it apply to them? How does it apply to my neighbors, my coworkers, the people that you may go to school with? Does it, does it apply to them or is it just to us on this corner? This is a universal message. This is for everyone. This is for the people in Iraq. This is for the people in Egypt, India, Kurdistan, Romania, Africa, everywhere that we're partnered and and places, many places that we're not partnered. It's for them. And so we're motivated in this work of the Great Commission. John MacArthur says it this way. These interludes encourage God's people in the midst of the fury and horror of divine judgment. And remind them that God is still in sovereign control of all events. Can we just pause? Do you believe that? That God is so sovereign over everything? During the interludes, God comforts his people with the knowledge that he has not forgotten you, loved ones. He has not forgotten them. And that they will ultimately be victorious. So with this, we take a breath. We just rest in the goodness of God that he's the one bringing judgment, not me. He is. I'm bringing his message, his gospel. So Revelation chapter 10, on go the cheaters. All right, here we go. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, And his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up, what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. But that in the days of the trumpet call, to be sounded by the seventh angel, and the mystery, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. Just as he announced to his servants the prophets, then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go and take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. This is the word of the Lord Here, loved ones, God breaks his silence. All that has been going on, and here we hear this voice from heaven. God is speaking in. He's speaking into the middle of all of this chaos, all of this judgment, all of this havoc. The significance of this interlude should not be overlooked. 
And so we want to take to heart, what do, we, what do we learn from this? What is God saying to the Apostle John here? How does this apply to my heart, to my life? Like, how will this change my conversation this afternoon at lunch? Is this just some, you know, time way down the, the road and we're not worried, not my problem? Or does this impact me? And I'm seeing people of all ages in here. Children, all the way to grandparents, all ages in here. What does it have to do with me? That should be the question that you're asking. First of all, we see this, the shocking message. And it's a, it's a shocking message, and John is told to conceal this message. Conceal the message. Seal it up. Loved ones, God does not owe you, and he does not owe me any explanation of what he has done, what he's doing, or what he will do. Do you believe that? God doesn't owe me any explanation. But you're the pastor, so what? He owes me nothing. Well, actually, he owes me hell. And that came on Christ. In my place, condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. That's what I had coming my way, and he took the brunt of death for me. And if you've trusted him, for you. If you haven't trusted him, that is an opportunity and an invitation for you today. Here, all of these judgments, they pause for a moment. God is sending in relief and comfort to his servant and to the churches, to his people. What, what did John see here? First of all, he, he, there's a display of God's majesty. He saw another, he says, I saw, and, and that's another significant, it, there's a change in, in timing here, and I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Now, some have thought and understood, well, this, this must be Jesus because this angel is just brilliant and powerful, but Jesus is not an angel. Okay, he's not another angel, another of the same kind, a mighty angel. So this angel is a, is a powerful being. Possibly it's Michael, but we're not told, so ultimately that doesn't matter which, what the name of the angel is. Just that you catch the significance of what John shared about this angel. This angel is mighty and he's magnificent. John describes him, he's overwhelming. It's truly the word awesome fits here for this angel. He sees this mighty angel coming down from heaven. So we don't know where John is located in this part of the vision, but he sees the angel coming down from God to display the glory of God and the will of God, to do the will of God. He sees that this angel is wrapped in a cloud. There's this vestment around him. And you think about the clouds and how brilliant they can be, how bright you hardly can look at them on certain moments when they catch the sun, and they reflect the glory of the sun. Clouds in Scripture are often connected with mysterious storms and devastating judgment. Maybe you were even watching the news this week, and you saw some of those tornadoes across Iowa, Nebraska, headed down to Oklahoma and the panhandle. And people just saw the footage of what looks like it came out of the movie, Tornado. Right? Twister. And then there it is. And, and some of them, they had it even come together. Multiple tornadoes join into force. One, and covering the size of a town. And I look at that and I think, and the very same people that video these things that often are blaspheming the name of God as they're watching them unfold. How do they think, how do we think that we will stand before this God that just does that and we're going to argue with him. We're going to debate with him. We breathe his air. We're made in his image. So here, this angel is descending. He's wrapped in a cloud. There's a rainbow. The word is iris. It's a, it's a Greek word. It's halo. All right, so, the, so we saw the around the throne was the, the rainbow in Revelation 4, 3. Now we see with this angel, and around him is like a rainbow halo displaying the glory of God. But what's significant about the rainbow, loved ones? Back to the great flood in Genesis 6. And then the Lord promised Noah and promised all humanity, I will never flood the entire earth globally again. 
And that covenant is still true, and we still see it in the, in the clouds and after a rain, and you look up and you see the rainbow, rainbow and which way is that, that weapon arced? It's not arced to humanity, it's arced to heaven. That in the rainbow, God is taking the judgment in Christ for us. And we deserve the bow to be facing us. It's his mercy. And we see this angel, he's come. We see this bow around his head that there he is with this halo. One day, God will judge the world by fire, but never again by water. John says, and in continuing to describe this angel, his face was like the sun that his face was brilliantly radiant. Our minds are drawn back to what John saw in Revelation 1. But there's differences between seeing the Son of Man, seeing Christ, and seeing this angel. Daniel had a vision of an angel. Bears resemblance, resemblance. Daniel 10 and verse 5. He said, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Now you know why I mock the little cherub, the little half-naked fat floating around Valentine's Day with the little arrow. That is not an angel of God, a holy angel, and that is not a fallen angel, a demon, serving his master, Satan. John says of this angel, his legs were like pillars of fire. Just try to imagine this being. I mean, Marvel can't touch this, you know? Uh, trying to recreate some kind of being like this, legs like flaming fire. This mighty angel is also a messenger. He comes with a little scroll open in his hand. It's not the same scroll that was handed to the lamb in chapter 5. The scroll is a, a, a little portion of that book, and this is for John, and it's for a powerful ministry that is yet to come. This angel is massive. John describes that he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Well, he's in the air, so that means he has complete authority over land, sea, and air. He's massive. It's all delegated authority. This mighty angel is on a mission. He called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. His booming voice will elicit the response of seven thunders. So we see in this angel the display of God's majesty. We also see the provision of God's mercy. That when the seven thunders had sounded, he said, I was about to write, but then I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders had said. Don't write it down, John. Put your pen away. Don't take notes on this one, John. The sound of seven thunders Maybe you've been out in a storm and you see the lightning and you start counting the seconds to know how far that storm is away from you, how far is that lightning away from you. And as it starts getting closer and closer, and then there's times when that lightning strikes and you don't have time to count the seconds and you evaluate where am I standing and where should I be standing? There's there's no messing, like there's no playing around with this kind of sound, the sound of seven thunders. It's hard for us to even imagine the volume and the weight of their sound. And that thunder just crackles, just booms through the air, shakes the ground, shakes windows in the house. And then John's told, seal it up. Now why is this important? Their message is sealed up for a divine reason. What do we need to learn about this? What do we pay attention to? It's the only message in Revelation that is sealed up and not unveiled to us. Here. Here it is about the seven thunders. It reminds me a little bit of Jack Nicholson's line in, in the movie, you can't handle the truth. There's something about the seven thunders that God says no. No, they can't have that. They can't handle it 
or possibly he will not allow these seven thunders to carry out what their intention is. So we've seen seven seals. We've seen seven trumpets. Here we have seven thunders. We're headed into seven bowls. And for whatever reason, the divine reason, maybe we'll find out in heaven one day, the Lord says regarding the seven thunders, don't write it down. And it is either they can't handle this right now, they'll be overwhelmed by this, or I'm going to hold back on that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. Grant Osborne, he says it this way, he says, John is being told to affirm God's sovereign control over the judgments proclaimed in the thunders and then is prohibited from revealing the contents to his readers. The major message is one of sovereignty God is in control, and the saints do not need to know the details. How does that sit with you? Don't we like to know the details? We like to have it all planned out. Some of you are ultimate planners. We will leave it this time. We will stop it here. We will pack this. We will go here. And you think, I am just next to godliness because I plan so well. And then you, you know, usually that person marries the person that has no plan. Right, like, woo, let's go. Where are we? What time? Doesn't matter. That's just, that's just part of premarital counseling, step one. <laughs> and I have many stories to use in that time together of uh, how that is borne out in our own marriage. And the Lord says, no. Don't tell him, John. Just seal that up. Here's another round of sevens. God also did this to Daniel. Just turn back with me. We, we haven't spent a lot of time going back and forth between Daniel, but I want you to go back into your Bibles, into the Old Testament, and find the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. And we're going to see a connection here of another time that one of God's prophets, because we see that come up in the text, Everybody's challenged on where do you find Daniel at? Ezekiel, Daniel. All right, Daniel chapter 12. And sometimes it's just helpful to see this just right in your Bible and and not necessarily even on the screen because it gives you the context. It can give you some curiosity to go back later and and look at that. But I I want to read this, Daniel 12. And at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge over uh, of your people, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. So those who are saved by grace through faith, same Old Testament and New Testament. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on the this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and a half a time. And that When the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. There's a note of humility for one of the prophets. That they were given messages that they did not always understand. But they wrote it down and they didn't doubt, but this is the word of God. Then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel. None of your business, Daniel. Don't worry about it, Daniel. 
For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes, the, makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335th day. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Uh, we talked about it a little bit this last week. James was teaching on Wednesday night about the Sadducees, and the Sadducees did not believe in the, in the resurrection. And some people will say, oh, that's New Testament. Right there it is. He's not going in the ground to be the end of all things. He will be there. You belong to Christ, you'll meet Daniel, you'll meet David, you'll meet Joseph. All of them, we will be together around the throne. Loved ones, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. So you go back to Revelation 10. This rem reminds me of, the, of what we learn in Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things the Lord told through Moses belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may, what's that word? Do. Not it does not say that we may know all the words of this law, that we may memorize all the words of the, Not that we would just meditate on all the words of the law. Blessed is, we get the promise in the blessing in Revelation 1, the one who reads, the one who hears, the one who reads aloud, and keep the word. It's, it's the same, Old Testament and New Testament. So here we see the secret things who, to whom do those belong, secret things? The Lord. But how many people are so infatuated with the next person that writes another book of something secret? My few minutes in heaven, people buy it off the shelves. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. So what, we can't know anything? Oh, there's plenty for us to know, to understand, and obey. How are we doing with the plain things? How are we doing with the main things? There are some people that will not do the plain things and the main things and simply obey. And then when you call them and you speak to them and you talk to them about it, they jump into fanciful arguments. You know what I'm talking about? Secret things. Well, did you know? And off they go with the latest thing they heard on YouTube or a podcast. Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but he has given to us plenty that is plain and clear for us to understand and do. Wasn't that point, the point of Irfan's message last Sunday? That's wonderful if you understand Elisha and Elijah, but where are you serving? You can't ride the coattails of Elisha, and neither can I. How well are we doing in serving the Lord our God faithfully and regularly? Now, the fulfilling we see then of God's mystery, we've seen his majesty, provision of God's mercy. Now we see the fulfilling of God's mystery he says, there'll be no more delay. It's coming to the intended end. Here the word of God was confirmed. A solemn oath is taken. It's very similar to what we read in Daniel 12. That angel had both hands raised up. Here this angel, angel has in his hand a little scroll, and he is taking, where, where have you seen this? Place your hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, we live in a world like, ah, oh, I, don't, I don't want the Bible, you know. Put, I like teen, Kleenex box. Put my hand on the Kleenex box. Yeah, you kind of lose some weight there, don't you? Let me, put, let me put my hand on an infallible book. 
you lose some of the punch of the living word of the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. He takes a solemn oath, little scroll in the left hand, raises the right hand to heaven. Now, now James warned against using oaths to deceive people. But that when we enter into oaths, we ought to be intentional of keeping those oaths. James 5, 12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. As Christians, we should not be people that have to just constantly, whenever you hear someone say, I'm not lying, you know what they're doing? Most likely, they're lying. Subconsciously, they're just telling you, uh, I, I don't believe what I'm about to say, but I want you to believe what I'm about to say. Okay? And James says for Christians, don't be people that you have to, like, I swear, I hope, you know, cross my heart, all that stuff that you have to go through all of these things to help make people believe that I'm really, really serious. I'm serious. I promise. I promise. I promise. Like, just simply say, are you going to be there? Yes, I'll be there. And then be there. Plenty of you have worked with people who say they're going to do something and it shows up on appointment day when it's supposed to be done and what do they say? Oh, yeah, I didn't have time for that. I didn't get it done. That ought not be a follower of Christ. If we say we're going to do something, if we say we're going to be somewhere in the simplest of areas, then we should do what we say. <coughs> say what you mean, mean what you say, and do what you say. That is pleasing to the Lord, not for us to receive glory of, of uh, punctuality, you know. I mean, I was raised on that. I'm like, punctual, like be early, you know. But that's not, that's not a spiritual gift, and it doesn't really add anything if you're looking down the nose at anybody who's running late. On the same time, let people trust in your word. You say, I'm going to serve in this way. I'm going to help in that way. Then be dependable that your yes means yes and your no means no, not, well, who said it? Oh, I hope, they, I hope they get there. I don't know. Can't really trust them too much. Now, this oath of this angel is made to the God of heaven. I don't think Jesus would be making oaths to his, to his father. Okay, so an angel. There is no God like our God. There's no mistaken identity here. There's no failure in keeping this vow. God is eternal. He says it this way, him who lives forever. Very similar to what we read in Daniel. That God is the creator of everyone and everything. And here the angel takes the vow to him who lives forever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea, and we don't even know everything in that thing. You ever seen some of these videos of stuff coming out of the sea? And like, what is that? I'm not swimming there. The Lord knows. He made it. Where do you think creativity comes from? We're made in the image of God. And no one is more creative than our God. The word of God will be completed. It was confirmed by an oath. And it will be completed. This is guaranteed. No more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be fulfilled just as he announced his servants, the prophets. Loved ones, not word of, one word of promise will fall unkept to the ground. Our God is faithful and he keeps his word. That's why we want to keep our word. Not so that we have a better reputation, but so that the Lord has a better reputation in the eyes of those who don't yet know him. Now, Peter, the apostle, he wrote about this, and we mentioned it, and I mentioned it when Daniel said, Lord, what's this about? None of your business. Uh, remember Jesus walking with Peter and John, and, and Jesus tells Peter that when you're old, you know, you're going to be carried where you don't want to go, signifying, John says, by the death he would die. And what does Peter say? Oh, that's uncomfortable. Lord, what about John back there? And what does, Peter, what does Jesus say to Peter? None of your business. If he lives till I return, none of your business, Peter. Your business is to obey and follow me. Mind your own business. Anybody ever, your parents have to tell you that? Teachers have to tell you that? Put your nose in your own work. Mind your own business. Just plagiarizing Jesus to Peter. 
Well, this is what Peter writes, 1 Peter 1.10. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. Okay, that's, remember Peter said, no, Lord, stop talking about sufferings of Messiah. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're speaking like a man. This isn't from heaven. This isn't from God. The only option then is from hell. The sufferings of Christ. Now Peter has it. And the subsequent glory. Suffering first and glory later. All false religion switches that around. Glory now and whatever to come later, however they define eternal life. This is Christianity here, and Jesus modeled this. Verse 12, it was revealed to them, to the prophets, that they were serving not themselves. Daniel wasn't serving Daniel. Ezekiel wasn't serving Ezekiel. Isaiah wasn't serving Isaiah. They were not serving themselves, but, he writes and says, you. Now let that sink in for just a moment. That God gave the ministry of Moses, Elijah, Elisha, all of the prophets, David the king, and who does he say, Peter say, they're serving You. He's writing to believers who are wondering, I'm not sure, should should I have trusted in Christ because my whole world is falling apart and persecution is coming in now? And Peter's reminding them, you didn't call yourself to salvation, first of all. He called you. You're on the path that he has chosen for you. And these prophets also wrestled with why and how long. So take comfort. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels long to look. That this mighty angel who's standing with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, little scroll in the hand, other hand, right hand raised to heaven, and he doesn't know anything about being personally redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That they watched the Lord, the creator of life, on a cross, and the word never came to rescue Jesus, and they knew who he was. This is mysterious to angels. But they understand who he is and that all of this is coming to bear. Ian Paul says it this way, the mystery of God has nothing to do with secret timetables, but the redemptive purposes of God in his offer of grace to unexpected people. Something that human reason cannot understand on its own. So that's why we're not making a huge deal of times and dates as we go through Revelation and miss the point that Jesus will be unveiled and this ought to change our lives this very minute. That if you are here without this, uh, without Christ this minute, you shouldn't say, well, maybe next hour I will repent of my sin and trust in him. Because you're not guaranteed that. Number two, a sobering message to consume. God's word must not be merely heard, but it must be taken to heart and deep down into our lives. This is not mere intellectual assent, checking the box. That's why we don't take our kids through a certain program at a certain age and just read to them the truths that we hold to and just ask them to nod their head and agree with us and check the box, and now we confirm that you're okay. Mm. Now, this is a work of God that is to be done on each individual heart, that each individual person has to take that truth deep down into their lives. God is sovereign over all, whether we see it or not, whether we believe it or not. And so the message of justice and judgment, loved ones, is both sweet and sour. Is that the kind of sauce you like with your chicken McNuggets? Sweet and sour. This message, there's a sweetness to this message, like honey, and then there's a bitterness to this message. God's justice is comforting. That's the sweet part. 
That's the part of the message that is like honey, that his justice is comforting. That'll come up on the screen. It's sweet to all believers. So John took the scroll, he ate the little scroll. He said, oh, that tastes good. That, there's a good taste there. He w- received it like in a few moments when we pass out the elements, the bread and the cup, and they go into your hand, and then there's a symbolism there of his body was broken, his blood was shed. But then we don't walk away and just leave them there. We're to take them down into, to digest them. These symbols, these symbols don't save. They're symbols of the one who saves. So we hold back communion from those who have not been saved because you're going through an empty ritual then. If you haven't yet been baptized, we say, hold off. Let's help you take the step of baptism because it's a first step of obedience. Don't be delaying in your obedience to the Lord. Put first things first. It's not most important that you that you partake of communion or that you join a church, that you belong to Christ, that you follow him in baptism, and then you join in with the congregation, the people that God has placed you in life with to worship and walk and work together. The psalmist said at Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Can I ask you again? Have you personally taken refuge in the Lord? You just can't escape it from this psalm. You can't escape it from this message. You can't escape it from Daniel. You can't escape it from Revelation. Ezekiel said it this way, chapter three, and he said to me, son of man, okay, we've we've heard this before. We've seen this before. Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat the scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth. He gave me this scroll to eat. Take this word, preach this gospel, first of all, to yourself. You realize that every message that I bring from this pulpit, it first of all has to be preached to my own heart. It has to work through me. It has to filter through my own heart. Jeremiah 15, 16, Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I love your word. Do you love the word of God like that? Oh, we want to. Lord, help us to love your word like this. So we love to rejoice that we were saved personally by grace through faith. I'm so thankful for the day that the Lord saved me, that he cleansed me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. Uh, That is good news. I love this message. This is the gospel. It's the good news to all who are being saved. We've come to know the saving power the cleansing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross, the message of the cross, the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, radically different. It's the power of God. Somebody without Christ and they hear the gospel and you need to trust in a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth that was crucified, buried, and they say rose again. (laughs) Really? 2,000 years ago this happened, and this has bearing on my life today? That's, that's silly. That's stupid. That's foolish. I'm busy. But to us who are being saved, that message is the power of God. That message is what changed my life. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are, believers, the aroma of Christ to God and among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. There's a fragrance there, and that fragrance often happens in persecution. It happens in crushing. It happens in suffering, and when we're crushed, there's an aroma that comes out when we're crushed and pressed down and persecuted that is unlike anything else. It's unlike just going through good times and wonderful times and promotion, and all this is going well and all that's going well. That's like everybody else. But when we lose the job, we lose the health, it doesn't go the way we planned and we still are faithful and humble and broken and authentic and we praise and we worship the Lord. Oh, there's a fragrance that just is is ascending to the Lord. It's pleasing to him. It's pleasing to the congregation. And those who are perishing say, what's going on with you? Why are you not cursing God right now? Because if I was in your spot, I'd be cursing him. 
And we come back with the answer, uh, you know, if they say, what is God doing? I don't know. I flat out don't know. And you trust him? Yes. More than I trust my own head, heart, or hands. We know that God will deal with all that is wrong and every wrongdoer. He will bring justice. We're certain about this. And so that's sweet to us because we know that all wrongs will be made right. And we see injustice. We see it in the court system. We see it in the legal system. We see it in politics. You see it at work. You see it all around. Sadly, at times, it's seen in the church and shouldn't be. It should be driven out. Jesus is the one who made the, the whip. Get out of my father's house. You have turned it into a den of robbers. Be gone with you. Pretty serious. And those who were being taken advantage of in that day by the powerful people, they could breathe. Like, whoa, finally, I thought it was all backwards, and nobody was acting like it's backwards. And that one over there that raises the dead, gives sight to the blind, he said it's all backwards. Get out of my father's house. Oh, I can worship without all this stuff. Okay, so that's pleasing to us, that's sweet to us, but when we think about God's judgment is coming, that's where it gets bitter. This aspect of the message brings a bitterness to our stomachs. When we think of the fate of anyone who lives and dies without Christ, this, in, this motivates us by grace. This changes our calendars it changes our lives we're going to see it just revelation 12 a page over verse 10 and i heard a loud voice in heaven saying now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. And all those people said, yeah. Who accuses them night and day before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love their lives not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. His days are numbered. So there's a sweetness, but there's a bitterness here. We ought to be tender like Paul. When Paul in Romans 9, 10, and 11, there was, there's a, in the letter to, to the Romans, there's a section there, chapters 9, 10, and 11, where he steps aside and he deals with the Jewish people. Lest someone say, God's done with Jewish people, Paul, a Jew, he writes about that. Romans 9 and verse 1, he said, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears we, me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great, here it is, sorrow, and unceasing anguish in my heart. Is that how you see non-believers? Is that how you see people who are protesting? For he says, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, Jewish people, according to the flesh. Romans 13, 12. How do we apply all this? The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. You, you see this. There's a sweetness in this message, but there's also a bitterness. And I think Paul's attitude toward his own countrymen that were so abusive to him, that gives us the instruction we need of how do we look on people who don't yet know Christ. We don't gloat. There, there's no... There's no sadistic rejoicing that punishment is coming to people. Punishment was due to me. And Paul said, if I could give up my own salvation so that my countrymen would come to faith, I would do it. But that's not how anyone is saved. You must come. 
And number three, verse 11, the saving message to convey. There's a shocking message, and the Lord says, conceal it. There's a sobering message. John, eat it. Take it down into you. Partake of it. And I'm sending you somewhere, John. God requires that we share his message of grace and of coming judgment with others. So if you are in Christ, loved ones, this morning, you're part of the Great Commission. You've been given a mission to go preach the gospel, to make disciples. So we have a reason to live. This is what we see. This is for John. John, he was sent out there to die. They tried to kill him, church history records, and they couldn't. So they put him on an island, let him rot, let him die out there. Let the wild beast eat him. And, and the Lord comes and shows up to John and says, no, I have other plans for you. You're going to live. This, mes- this message, this commission, this recommission for you, John, I'm sending you back. I'm not done with you. It was personal. Jesus called him in his earthly ministry, commissioned him at the outset of Revelation, and now here comes this word, eat it, and I'm going to send you proclaiming this message, John. He's not going to die on the island of Patmos. And can I make an application for you? God's not done with you. Even if you haven't come to know Christ yet or not, he's he's still being patient with you. Even if you're mocking him, living in sin right now, he's being patient with you. He's not finished with your story yet. This message is personal. This is for you. Yes, it's for the person next to you. But it's for you. Don't miss this message for you. We heard it last week, didn't we, from Irfan? God specializes in using nobodies. I love that. The no-hopers. Well, that's what we see here. Using jars of clay to carry his gospel to the nations. So, are you fully surrendered to him this morning? Have you surrendered all to him? Because then we have a gracious ministry to fulfill. You must again. Oh, come on, Lord. You know how many messages I've preached and then it's just not happening, Lord. I'm on this island out here, Lord. Nobody's listening to me, Lord. It didn't go well before, Lord. I've taught that class. I've served in that nursery. I've welcomed people. I've done all the things to do. Yeah, must again. Depend on me for the grace again. You ever feel like giving up? You ever feel like just saying, I'll let somebody else do it? You must again. Run to win. Run through the tape. Finish your race. No excuses. Oh, I've done this so long. Let somebody else do it. Mm. I've told my family so many times, and they just keep turning a deaf ear to me. You must again. And again. And again. And again. Fulfill your ministry. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, and this is how the body is built up. Where are you serving the Lord faithfully, loved ones? I love what Paul said to Timothy. He just tightened his screws down on him. 2 Timothy 4, 5. Hey, Timothy, as for you, in contrast to all the false teachers, as for you, hey, listen up, son, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, Timothy. And I could go all down every single row to every single member and say, fulfill your ministry, Don't worry about what people are doing around. Encourage them, pray for them, but don't let your ministry be dependent on if they're serving or not serving, if they're faithful or not faithful. You fulfill your ministry. And this message had to come right through my own heart before it could come to you. Fulfill your own ministry, wise, because we have a glorious gospel to proclaim. We have a glorious gospel to proclaim. He said, you're going to take this message. You're going to prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. You're going global. This message is going global, John. This message is universal. It's for all of these peoples, nations, languages, and kings. It's about all of these peoples, nations, languages, and kings. 
No one is excluded from the scope of this message. And this is exactly what Peter pre- preached, Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given on, uh, under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. There's one name that saves, and it's the name of Jesus. He's the one who saves. The message is universal, and it is a message that is all about Jesus, about the King of kings who suffered, He died, was buried, and rose to life the third day and is coming again soon. This is the glorious gospel that we have, church, to not hide it under a bushel. Remember the song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. Right? And we learn that so well. And then you hit middle school. And then you hit high school. Hide it under a bushel. Just put that somewhere else. What will people think of me? It doesn't matter. What does God say about you? That's what matters. So why should we take this to heart? Let's look at the summary here. Why do we take this to heart? Maybe you've experienced some bitterness in ministry and serving the Lord. Maybe you've experienced some of that sweetness. Maybe it came mixed together. There's a shocking message here. And John said, the Lord did John through that angel. Just hold that back. Don't give that one. But you need to take this message and you need to eat it. This is for you. And you need to take this message and you need to share it. And don't stop. As long as the Lord gives us breath, don't stop sharing this message because he is saving people. He's changing people. What about you today? Where are you at with Christ? What is your next step to respond in obedience to this word? Will you stand with me? Worship team, you come. In a few moments, the men will prepare and we'll receive communion together. Father, oh, you are so good. You are the Lord of heaven and earth. You are eternal. You are the uncreated one. And you, through Christ, have come down to us and you have made a way for us, all who are sinners, to be forgiven of our treason, to be forgiven of our sin, our rebellion, our idolatry, our lust, our temp- all of the temptation that we have fallen and succumbed to, Lord. You made a way for us, and we are desperate for you. So, Father, I pray for those who have not yet trusted you that today would be the day that they simply take their hands and just surrender to you. May their hands represent their own life, their own heart. They say, here I am, Lord, take me, forgive me, cleanse me. That they would trust in you, confess you as Lord. Believing in their heart that you, Jesus, have been raised from the dead in their place and trust fully on Christ. And for those who belong to you, Father, I pray that we would live boldly. That we would take this message, first of all, down into our own hearts and into our own lives and meditate on it, and feed on it, and then share it with others, the bread of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.